webinar clip five, building reading skills and supporting literacy in key stage two. So we start to build on phonics knowledge, continuing with reading support. The game-based learning of the Trugs card games are very useful for fun phonics support at home. As your child's phonics skills develop, they can progress to using Trugs games box two and box three, depending on their reading level, which is a fun way to continue supporting their reading skills. If your child is still struggling with reading as they progress through primary school, it can be difficult to find books with basic phonics that match their interest level. Barrington Stokes books offer unique reading books with unpatronising content matched to the age of the reader, not their reading level. They are short books and chapters to help build confidence and stamina with accessible layouts and spacing to stop the page from becoming overcrowded. And they also use off-white paper to help reduce any visual stress. Audio books help develop vocabulary, especially useful if your child isn't yet reading a lot of texts. These can be purchased through apps like Audible on Amazon, or I recently discovered the Yotto audio book player for my son that he listens to when he's going to sleep. Nessie Reading and Spelling is an effective online programme for use at home and in school. It is a brilliant intervention solution for schools, as long as it is monitored in school and can then be practised at home, or it can be used purely at home, set up by parents for a small monthly subscription. It uses game-based learning because in a similar way to the Trugs card games, if children have fun, then their learning becomes more memorable. The game-based learning is combined with a highly structured incremental system based on well-established synthetic phonics principles of learning, and we highly recommend them as an effective intervention. When your child becomes more independent and wishes to choose their own books, try using the simple five finger test. They need to find a page without pictures, read it and hold up a finger every time they can't read a word. If they stick up five or more fingers, then the book is too difficult to read independently. Two or three fingers is ideal so that this is slightly challenging and still developing their vocabulary. I will model this in the next two minute clip alongside paired reading, which is when you read together with your child to help with intonation and expression. Ideally, you'll be listening to your child read for a minimum of 10 minutes a day, discussing the story and checking for comprehension and still reading to your child as well as listening to them. When doing paired reading, your child still needs to have a sense of ownership over their reading. So a signal agreed before reading, like a thumbs up sign, is useful for when your child would like to continue independently. It's brilliant if you can find uninterrupted time to read daily together. The text could be anything from a newspaper article, a poster, a library book, a magazine they like, such as The Week Junior, or even a comic, as long as they're reading. And now for a short clip that models paired reading. OK, Chloe, so yesterday we were looking at how to choose a book for you to read by yourself. And basically you find a book you like the look of, you turn to a page without pictures and then you read from the page and you lift a finger each time you find a word you're not sure how to read. So if you put up five or more fingers, then the book you've chosen needs to be read with an adult who can help you with the tricky words. If you put up less than five fingers, one or two, you know, ideally, then it's a good choice and you should be able to read the book by yourself. So how did you find this book, um, Runaway Girls by Jacqueline Wilson? Well, I only put up two fingers, so I think it's a good choice for me. OK, brilliant. We'll give it a go. We're going to do some paired reading where I read with you. Um, if you start to feel that you'd like to read it by yourself, we need a signal for you to show me that you'd like to do that. What do you think would be a good signal? Uh, can we put up thumbs up? Yep, that's a great idea. Then you can carry on by yourself. But if you get stuck on a word, I'll join in again, helping you with the word, and we'll carry on together. Is that okay? Yeah. Brilliant. Let's give it a go. And how about you use your pointy finger to guide your reading? Off we go. Monmouth Street wasn't at all how I'd expected. I'd imagined a couple of drapers with neat window displays and smart staff in black dresses and white aprons. Every shop here sold clothes. The windows 
so crammed, and crammed full with stalls in front of the stores with further clothes laid out like whiting on a fish stall. Lovely. We'll stop there, Chloe. Normally we'd read for longer, perhaps about 10 minutes. Anyway, for today's purposes, how did you find that? And were there any tricky words there that you didn't know? Um, well, I found it okay, but I didn't really know drapers. Drapers, okay. That was a type of shop um, in the Victorian times that, that sold textiles and material to make things with. Okay. okay, brilliant. We'll stop there for today. Thank you. So, as you can see, the aim of paired reading is really to build your child's confidence and fluency expression and intonation, all of which will help to improve their reading comprehension. And remember, at the end of a reading task, um, discuss what you've read. Ask them open-ended questions such as, how do you think the story will end? And this will encourage them to think about the story as they go. Towards the end of Key Stage 2, we should be continuing to support reading, spelling and writing and adding new ways to scaffold their work and give strategies to support them working more independently. This may be with subject specific spelling lists for easy reference. For example, you can easily Google Key Stage 3 subject specific spelling lists. Many schools have produced these online. You can print them off um, and attach them to the front of each subject in an exercise book or a folder. And these have useful, commonly used words in each subject. Or other strategies may include providing visual and creative writing plans. I'll look at this in more detail shortly. So it's important to look at where the process of reading and comprehending are breaking down so that intervention can be targeted. The definition of madness is doing the same thing over and over again using the same methods and expecting different results. So ideas to support reading skills as well as the paired reading to support fluency and expression can be helping children to read for meaning in the text and we can do this by frequently asking questions about what they have read. It might also be helpful to explain to them how to visualise in their mind's eye what they have read. A common method for doing this could be to ask them to visualise a blank television screen, for example, and to imagine an object or a person on the screen. For example, you might say, imagine you can see a clown. Now, can you tell me the colour of the clown's hair or what the clown is wearing? This is a simple exercise to start to get children to know how to visualise things in their mind's eye with what they've read. It's also important to continue to develop their vocabulary. Perhaps keep a bank of new words in a notebook or on flashcards. Brilliant resources for developing vocabulary can be found on the Mrs Wordsmith website, as shown on the right of the screen. Um, and also, vocabulary development is extremely important to include emotional vocabulary. The language of emotions is needed for social interactions and self-awareness in teenage years. There are some great resources to help with this and I've included a useful link to a blog by Nationwide Children's Org in the links at the end entitled Using Emotional Language, How to Talk to Your Kids About Feelings. Scaffolding for writing is important as it supports many weaknesses. For example, it reduces the amount held in the working memory. It also supports difficulty with organising and sequencing information. It helps to break a task into chunks that can be tackled one at a time to avoid that feeling of overwhelm with a large task. And it gives a clear overview of what the aim of the piece of writing is. Using a story mounting plan shows that a story Structure requires an introduction, a build-up of tension, a problem, and then leading into a resolution and an ending. An alternative approach has been developed on the right-hand side using a story star. This has been developed by the Bullet Map Academy, and it's a visual and creative plan similar to a mind map, making it easier to see which part of a story you're lacking. They have a short course on this method for £19 on their website and I've attached a link to this as it's a great way for dyslexics to write stories. 
As your child gets older and the demands change, there are many different graphic frames that can be used for the task in hand. The hardest thing is convincing the learner that this is worth doing, that it's worth the time and the effort, and it makes things easier in the long run. If you can provide a framework such as the one shown, it can immediately de-stress a large writing task. But remember, each learner will have different strengths and preferences with regard to these frameworks.